Technology is changing the way we connect, learn, and do business. On this season of the Digital Leaders Podcast, we sit down with some of the UK's most influential thought leaders in government, enterprise, and entrepreneurship to learn more about what they are doing to digitally transform themselves and the organizations they lead, why it matters, and what we can do as listeners to build our own prosperous, digitally enabled, and connected communities. The time is now. The place is the Digital Leaders Podcast, and the future is digital. Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode one of the Digital Leaders Podcast. My name is Tara Ferguson, and I am the founder of the podcast production studio, SBT Digital, and I am thrilled to be able to work with digital leaders here in the UK to sit down with some of the country's most influential digital leaders and learn more about their passion for the digital space, why digital literacy matters now more than ever, and how we as listeners can build a thriving digitally literate workforce here in the UK. To kick off episode one, we are joined by international human rights lawyer, social impact entrepreneur, and co-founder and chief creative officer of The Conduit, Paul Fancil. Paul grew up during the apartheid in South Africa and has spent a majority of his career advocating for those with no voice. As a result, Paul has been recognized as a global leader for his work in social impact and transitional justice and was chosen as a young global leader by the World Economic Forum in 2008. On today's episode, Paul shares the impact growing up during the apartheid had on his career, how he is leveraging technology for social change, and how he has been able to recruit some all-star guests for his latest project, The Conduit. So with that, please welcome our first guest of the series, Paul Fancil. Thank you, Paul, for being on the show. It's a great pleasure. So before we talk about your latest project, I was wondering if you could share with us what impact you think growing up in South Africa during the apartheid had on your career. I think it was profoundly formative on everything I've done since. Um, you know, I, I grew up in as a white South African under apartheid and was always enormously lucky to, to be born into a household where my parents told me that apartheid was neither desirable nor natural, but something that was evil and should be resisted. Um, and I think that that conditioned me from a pretty early age. And so when I went to university, when I was 18, I, and this was in 1988, pre the release of Nelson Mandela, right. and at the high point of the resistance to apartheid, um, I was really plunged into the reality of what it is to try and um, overthrow a system that was a crime against humanity and was profoundly evil, um, and encountered some incredibly courageous activists who had been working for democracy their entire lives. And that really influenced a lot um, my journey and how I saw the world. When you were in university, what were you studying at the time? I was studying, I, I, I did a liberal arts degree. I studied um, politics, sociology, English and law. Um, I was always going to be a lawyer um, from when I was 12. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, and South Africa was a really fascinating place to be studying law because um, we had a, a legal system that could paradoxically within the framework of uh, the apartheid state be used to fight for justice. And uh, even though it was a racist legal system, there were still sufficient gaps of autonomy within it that one could use it to to fight for justice. Now you had the opportunity to work alongside Desmond Tutu. Um, what was that like for you? One of the greatest honors of my life, um, a truly remarkable individual. Um, Desmond Tutu was the chair of South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, a body appointed by Nelson Mandela to look at the crimes committed. Uh, during the conflicts of the past in South Africa. 
Um, and I served as the commission's executive secretary. So I helped determine both the policy and the strategy for the commission and um, sat in on commission meetings alongside with the commissioners. And it was a remarkable moment. It gave victims an opportunity to tell their stories and have their suffering acknowledged. It was an official record of who did what to whom in South Africa, who were the victims, who were the perpetrators, how did it happen, why did it happen, what were the causes for the crimes, who, who bore responsibility. It also um, provided a carrot for perpetrators to come forward and disclose their crimes um, through an offer of amnesty. So the commission really um, was kind of um, uh, a window into the soul of South Africa uh, and an opportunity for us to begin the very difficult and painful process of healing after um, you know, the abuses of apartheid. And now, would you say that that experience was also the catalyst for you going on to found the International Center for Transitional Justice? It absolutely was. And when I'd finished working for the Truth Commission, um, I don't think those of us who were involved fully appreciated how um, globally recognized the commission had been for its work. And therefore, I got a scholarship, went to New York, went to study at uh, NYU Law School. And as I arrived, um, the phone started ringing off the hook with many people from many countries interested in our experiences. Um, and so instead of being a, a lone ranger and a consultant who would then fly around the world and lend one's expertise, a few of us decided to form an organization um, that would try in a more comprehensive and systematic way provide comparative policy, policy advice to heads of states, to governments, to human rights organizations, to victims groups on the best ways to deal with a legacy of terrible human rights abuse and to give people insights as to what strategies are effective and what strategies are ineffective, what strategies are likely to lead to sustainable peace and the protection of human rights and which strategies are likely to, le to lead in the opposite direction. Um, and we grew that from just three of us to, you know, uh, over yeah, well hundred people to a global organization. So it was a it was a really a wonderful experience. And you were there for how long before you you left and started your next project? I worked at the International Center for Transitional Justice for um, a, about eight years, and then decided to found a fashion brand. Yes called Mayet that sourced its goods from artisans around the globe and tried to um, harness their skills to produce beautiful clothes, but also to give them the dignity of work and to give them opportunity. Right. And the skills to be able to kind of create their own, um, I guess, business and income, so to speak. That's absolutely correct. So I wanted to, to know in your experience, how has technology helped you to further your mission? I think that technology is a fundamental part of the human condition in the 21st century. Um, we are now impacted by technology in every aspect of our lives. It is a source of an enormous amount of productivity. It has reinvented the way we learn, the way we communicate, the way we create, the way we watch, the way we eat, the way we heal, um, every aspect of our lives. Um, and so um, in my, you know, in my prior lives, you know, you take for granted that you, you, you know, you run a global organization that in which people in East Timor are in real time contact with people in simultaneously New York, Bogota in Colombia, Sarajevo, uh, Ghana, Accra. Um, so 
you know, trying to start a global conversation about how nations reckon with the past was just fundamentally enabled by technology. Our fashion brand, you know, you source um, silk from Varanasi, India. Right. And we would take that and, you know, you would be getting it hand loomed in a very small community and you would be able to sit in a studio in New York and look at the patterns and send back feedback in real time. And you'd be able to design jewelry in a studio in New York and send feedback in real time to artisans working in Kibera uh, in Kenya um, where they're hand carving horn and bone and hand pouring um, metal jewelry. So, you know, those are, those, it's, it's, those are remarkable how the world shrinks. Yes. And it's actually remarkable how, you know, Bogota or East Timor or Varanasi have internet connections as well. And it just enables so much more opportunity for them as a result. Exactly. No, I mean, as each day goes by, we have greater connectivity. The, you know, the digital divide hopefully begins to erode information starved communities and communities that don't benefit from connectivity are beginning to benefit from them. And, you know, the enormous opportunities that that generates is going to improve. Um, so obviously these are, these are things in 2018, we all take for granted. And, you know, I think there's some ways in which it's very helpful to pause and just think of the miracle of what we're able to, the speed at which we're able to transmit information, but the way in which we're able to collaborate and share information across cultures and continents and peoples is just extraordinary. It really is. And I know it's something that you're very passionate about. And I believe it's a big pillar in your latest project, The Conduit, where you're looking at the impact technology has on society from the future of work to data to privacy. And I wanted to know why was that an important pillar for you to establish within The Conduit? Well, I think if, you know, the, the conduit is a community of people who are passionate about positive social change. We have a 40,000 square foot building in the heart of Mayfair um, that is gathering together people from the worlds of finance, uh, entrepreneurship, creativity. So art, fashion, film, music, literature, design, theater, television, journalism, and then a cluster of um not-for-profits, social entrepreneurs, philanthropists, foundations, think tanks, research institutes. And um, that group of people are uh, collaborating, discussing, working together, sharing ideas, um, downloading on best practices. And in all of these terrains, technology is having an absolutely you know massive impact um if you care about climate change and sustainability the incredible advances that have been made recently in the manufacture of solar panels mm -hmm. and the efficiencies that we have there combined with the efficiencies that you have with batteries combined with the fact that you now have entire communities who are doing their banking online via mobile phones right. has enabled an entire industry uh, of off-grid solar entrepreneurs put onto the roofs of people's houses, charging up batteries during the day, enabling people to use clean cook stoves and appliances throughout the day and lighting at night for people to read and kids to do their homework in a way that is clean, that takes kerosene out of people's homes so they're not smoking the equivalent of two packs of cigarettes a day. Right. Um, and these things, you know, solar technology, battery technology, mobile technology uh, combined lead to this incredible reservoir of social good. Um, and if you're wanting to advance this and scale it and accelerate it, you have to understand these technologies and know how to use them. Definitely. And I think, you know, to be fair, I mean, when you're saying, you know, giving them solar power so children can read at night, for somebody like myself in a first world country, 
it's almost, it's very hard to think about what that's like and that there are children around the world that still don't have that. Uh, yes. I mean, we, we take these things for granted and, uh, you know, there are more than a billion people on this planet who don't have, you know, regular access to power. Um, and you know what, how that impacts their lives and stores their opportunities is 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 extraordinary. Um, so, and conversely, you know, the good news is if you if you connect people to power um, and do so in a clean and sustainable way, the 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 impact on human development is is extraordinary. For sure, and I imagine that's um, like you mentioned, kind of the premise of the conduit is to bring together all these people who are passionate about social change to be able to help make these developments a reality and leveraging technology to do so. That's exactly right. And you know, the, the, we will, the conduit will have about 150 talks a year. Um, you know, we will be addressing climate change and sustainability, economic opportunity and job creation, skills, learning and education, health, wellness and nutrition, women's empowerment, uh, equality, justice, and peace, uh, and arts and culture. And in each of those thematic areas, those seven sort of streams, we're going to be presenting the very best practices, the most interesting ideas, the people who are working on solutions. We're not interested in a description of the problems of the world, because I think we know many of them already. And even if you don't know what the problems of the world are, somebody can very quickly describe them to you. But a much more productive use of time and energy and ingenuity is to say, how do we tackle them? So the idea of the conduit is to really give people the very best ideas um, and then to find ways of people collaborating and assisting and working with each other have an impact fund to fund the best ideas that emerge from amongst the members of the group. And then also kind of make it a, a place of incredible hospitality. So world-class food and a great music venue and screenings. Um, and we're just very blessed to have a building that can accommodate all of that. Yeah. So you did mention you are in the Mayfair district. So you are in London. Um, and yeah, speaking of food, it's pretty awesome because you guys have Massimo Bottura, who was featured on The Chef's Table, that's where I saw him, coming in September, correct? He's going to be a resident chef, is that my understanding? That's exactly right, yeah. So we're very, Massimo is not only, you know, one of the... A Chef's know, Table star. <laughs> one of the really top chefs in the world, you know. Osteria Francescana, his restaurant has really been rated as the top three, sometimes the top one uh, restaurants in the world. So we're incredibly privileged to have him. But why we're interested in him is not just because he's a food genius. Um, it's also because he has a deep social commitment. He's established um, a refettoria around the world. And, a know, refettoria? What's a refettoria? It's a, it's, a, it's a feeding hall, a place where you provide, provide food to people, but in his case, also social services, mental health, um, care, uh, and other kinds of services. And so there is one in Earl's Court in London. They've been established in Brazil and in Mexico. Um, and his not-for-profit arm is really interested in trying to think about food as a source of justice, a source of nutrition, a source of health, trying to distribute food in a way that is more fair. So it's wonderful to be able to partner with him because I think we, we see the world very much in the same way. Yes, definitely. And so obviously for people listening, we did mention it, it was um, a members club. Now I know up to now it's been invite only, but you guys are launching summer of 2018. So I wanted to know who can apply to be a part of the conduit. Yeah, as I said, I think the, the conduit is, is trying to be um, not so much a club, more a home or a platform or a community. We happen to have this gorgeous building that, um, that people okay. will be welcome in. And, and, and what we're trying to do is say we, we welcome applications from people who share that passion who see the world's great challenges as opportunities waiting to be solved. Um, and 
the we have very carefully you know selected and curated and um identified people from all walks of life um to to be members of the conduit community um but because we can't you know possibly know everybody in london who is either you know passionate about or curious about or keen to be engaged in or actively engaged in efforts to um, achieve positive social change um, we will you know begin to invite applications sometime in in august and september when um when the building is fully open so i wanted to know what is the end goal with the community and ecosystem you're building with the conduit i think we really i mean one of the things I always say about the conduit is it has the generosity of a platform um, that, you know, our job is to engage people, to introduce people, to facilitate uh, dialogue, information sharing, collaboration, friendships, a community. Um, and we're really trying to um, help start up formation of businesses to, that are trying to crack um, social problems take existing businesses and scale them to provide very large businesses with um, uh, tools to think about um, how they can take their existing um, production processes or, you, you know, the core offering in their business plan and uh, enhance the ways in which it have, you know, greater positive impact. Um, so, you know, I think our goal is to be, a stimulant, a place of fertility, a place of growth, um, a pr and a place of problem solving. I love that. So my final question for you is, how can organizations like digital leaders help and support organizations like The Conduit? You're helping and supporting by... Um, by this interview, by giving us a voice, by saying, you know, allowing us to tell people who may be listening to this uh, about what we're doing and our mission. And if that, if that resonates for them to be in touch, I think, you know, in the fullness of time, we're going to make available our content so that even if you haven't signed up as a member, there are opportunities to, um, to be able to listen and access the kind of really revolutionary content that we'll be presenting online. I mean, I think there are, you know, in some ways there are no substitutes for being in the room and getting to meet people and be, you know, being introduced and, yes. and human contact, but technology doesn't do a bad job um, as a sort of second order benefit of making the content more widely available. Certainly. Yeah. That would be amazing. I need to figure out how I can get in to ha have dinner courtesy of Massimo. <laughs> yeah, those are going to be the hottest tickets in town. There's no <laughs> doubt about it. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm like, okay, how do I? <laughs> um, so, okay, so now we're going to go into our lightning round. So I'm going to ask you a question and you're going to tell me the first thing that comes to mind. Great. All right, so here we go. The one book I would recommend to all listeners and why is? Anatomy of a Miracle by Patty Waldemeyer, um, former Financial Times journalist, uh, who describes the negotiations which brought uh, an end to apartheid. Oh, interesting. The one person I would like to have lunch with is? Barack Obama. Um, I think he's been one of the most thoughtful, principled, inspirational politicians of our time who displayed some of the highest levels of integrity, some of the greatest levels of empathy, um, and a person who tried to steer uh, the United States to be a more just and inclusive country. I would agree with all that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, one thing people would be surprised to learn about me is? I don't like taking elevators. Mm -hmm. And the advice I would give my 15 year old self would be? Mm, 
never lose faith in humanity's capacity to be good and um, always find ways of accelerating our potential to make change. Awesome. Do you have any final words of wisdom for our listeners? Yeah, I would say that if you were to choose any moment in human history to be alive, you would choose today, notwithstanding all the challenges, some existential in the form of climate change that we are facing. Um, humanity has never had the wealth, the technology, the opportunity, the insights, and the ability to um, make positive change at scale as we've had now. And so I would, I would say these, these are incredibly exciting times and there are moments in which we can achieve enormous good if we, if we focus on it and if we are creative and entrepreneurial about it. So go to it. All right, that is it for episode one of the Digital Leaders Podcast. But now we want to hear from you. Do you agree with Paul? Do you agree that as a result of technology, this is one of the most exciting times to be alive and make positive changes of scale? We want to know your thoughts. So make sure you share your comments with us in iTunes or tag us on social at DigiLeaders or hashtag DigiLeaders. And if you want to find out more about Paul and The Conduit, head on over to our website, digileaders.com and click the podcast tab. We have all that information there. Next week, we sit down with serial entrepreneur, angel investor, and founder of Founders for Schools, Sherry Kutu, to discuss what she is doing to foster digital literacy in the classroom. So make sure you are subscribed to the podcast via iTunes so you do not miss it. That is it for this week's episode of the Digital Leaders Podcast. I'm your host, Tara Ferguson. Thank you so much for listening, and we will be back next week with another episode of the Digital Leaders Podcast.